Good morning, Calvary. Good morning. My name is Stephen Nichols. I'm thrilled to be with you today. And I, I want to start off by saying that we have a problem in the Nichols household as of late. And it has to do with the young man behind me on the screen. And you may be thinking, no, of course not. What problem could he cause? He's so cute. Uh, and this problem, his name is Gabriel, he'll be two in December, and he's in toddler stage, and he hates bath time, absolutely hates bath time right now. And the reason why we know he hates bath time is because he lets us know that he hates bath time. And when we put him in the bath, um, it's only been happening for a couple of months. He used to love it, but now for the past couple of months, when we put him in the bath, he won't sit down. He just, has anyone else ever had that problem with their kids? He won't sit down. He just stands in the bathtub and we've done everything to try to get this kid to sit down in the bath, including attempting to like force his legs to bend and pop. he's stronger than you think he would be. We can't get it. And so he'll stand there. And, and what this means now is instead of just like regularly, you know, rinsing him, we have to just dump water on him, like throw it at him, like where we don't have running water or something. And the problem with this is that he, when we do this, he gets even more frustrated and the whole time. It's, it's actually really sad. He's, he's crying and saying, I want to get out. I want to get out. I want to get out. It's heartbreaking, actually. But then it gets even worse because when we go to rinse his hair from the soap in his hair, because he won't sit down, he doesn't lean his head back. He gets soap in his eyes. And as you can imagine, this makes the entire situation that much worse because now he's in pain. Now he's even more frustrated. He's yelling even louder. I want to get out. I want to get out. And the worst part about it is he thinks that we are doing this to him, that this is our fault. He's like, how could you do this to me? Stop putting this soap in my eyes. He's, he thinks that we are intentionally causing him pain in the bathtub and we're attempting the very best that we can to tell him, Gabriel, if, if you would just sit down and lean your head back, you wouldn't get soap in your eyes. But as you can imagine, he doesn't get this. He doesn't understand this. And it's heartbreaking because he looks at us with the pain in his eyes and thinks that, that we're doing this intentionally, or at the very least that we don't care that we're causing him pain. But, but really, he just stinks. He needs a bath. <laughs> and the, this next passage and story that today that we're reviewing, that we're looking at, is very similar to bath time, I think, at the Nichols household, at least in some ways that we have a story where it seems as if God is intentionally causing pain to the nation of Egypt. And it's the story of the, the plague of the firstborn son. And in this story, in order to attempt to convince Egypt, to convince Pharaoh to let the nation of Israel go, God strikes down the firstborn child of all the households in Egypt. And we have to ask the question, and if you're not asking this question, uh, maybe we should bring this to light. How on earth do we deal with the morality of God in this story? How do we deal with the morality of God that he would choose to strike down the firstborn child, a child for a sin that they did not commit? How do we deal with this? So my objective today, what I, what I want to be able to attempt to accomplish today is I want to try to figure out how do we, how do we see a God of grace in this story? A God of grace that we believe that we follow. Is this actually a God of grace or is this something completely different all in and of itself? How do we see a God of grace in the story? So that is, that is my hope of what we will attempt to accomplish today. And I want to ask, are you guys willing to go through that journey to ask this difficult question with me today? Are you with me on this? Okay. And I think one of the things that we have to start off with with this story is what is motivating God to do the things that he is doing? What is activating God to take these kinds of actions? And I think that we have to start at the very beginning of Exodus. We can't forget what's happening. That in this point of time, Israel has been in slavery for 400 years in Egypt. For 400 years of brutal forced labor, they are a minority group in the nation of Egypt who are being oppressed systematically. And not only that, not only is slavery, as if slavery wasn't bad enough, but Pharaoh gives the order for mass genocide. In an attempt to further oppress the people of Israel, he kills the first, or he kills baby boys and throws them into the Nile River to further oppress the, the people of Israel. 
This is pain and suffering beyond anything that we could ever imagine. We cannot fathom the depths of suffering that Israel is, is walking through in this time. And this is what brings God to respond. Exodus 2 uh, tells us this. During those days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob and God saw the people of Israel and God knew. We have to keep the plague of the firstborn son in light and see it through the lens of this passage. That the thing that motivates God to action is not anger, it is not vengeance, it is not a need to cause pain on somebody else, but the motivation behind God's movement to action is compassion for his people. That he hears the voice of his people crying out, and he is so moved to compassion for them that he responds. And I wanna pause first here and just pull this out. At the very least, if we can get nothing from this story, I wanna pull this out, that if God is, it is true to hear the cries of pain and groaning of his people, do you think that it is possible that he could hear yours too? Do you think it is possible that God just might hear your cries of suffering and pain, and they do not fall on a God who is not listening. So out of this, God moves to action. He says, I'm gonna do something about this. I cannot let these people continue to suffer. And he moves to action. And in Exodus 11, he tells Moses, he says, go tell Pharaoh, go tell Pharaoh that tonight at midnight that I'm going to come through and I'm going to strike the household and every firstborn son, I'm going to strike their firstborn son so that he may know that I am God and so that he may let my people go. But how on earth do we reconcile that? How do we deal with that idea? <laughs> What's funny about this plague is that it's the last plague is the final plague in a series of plague of 10 plagues that are famous in the Bible. And it's the very last one. We're not gonna look at all of them, but I wanna to connect to the very first plague because I think these two are very much related uh, intentionally here. And the very first plague, plague that God tells Moses to bring Pharaoh to the banks of the Nile River. And he says, in order to get Pharaoh to let my people go, I'm going to turn the Nile River to blood. And he brings Pharaoh to the banks of the Nile River and the river turns to blood. And it's almost as if uh, God is communicating to Pharaoh and says, Pharaoh, I know what you did. The blood from the babies that you threw in that river, the blood is crying out to me for justice. I know what you did. You thought that you got away with that, Pharaoh, but you did not. You cannot, I cannot allow this to happen. And more than that, he's also communicating to Pharaoh in this moment. He says, Pharaoh, unless you change your ways, unless you change your heart, unless you do something different, then this blood will be the same thing that happens to your people. And he is giving them a warning. He says, the very action that you have displayed on Israel, I'm going to turn onto your head and do the same thing to your people. And he gives them a warning, a warning in which Pharaoh never gave Israel. And he doesn't just do it once. He does it nine times. It says, Pharaoh, change your heart. This is coming. The consequences of your actions are coming. Change your heart. Let my people go or this decision will be turned back on your head. And as foreign as this sounds, I believe that we are meant to see these plagues, these strikes as an act of grace. That the purpose of these plagues is not to inflict pain. It's not to just get back at, at Pharaoh. The purpose of, this, of these plagues is to provide warnings for Pharaoh. Say, Pharaoh, unless you change your way, destruction is coming for you in your house. And God is pleading with Pharaoh to take a different course of action. That these judgments can be seen as an act of grace. 
And I want to name this first because I think this is one of the fears, at least that I have felt, I know that many others feel too, that uh, we think when we read the story that we say, well, if, if, if this is how God responds, does that mean that if I sin or if I make a mistake, if I mess up, whether in the past or present, is God going to respond in a similar way? And we become very frightened and fearful. I don't know about you, but that hits me. It's like, oh, I should probably get my, my stuff in order. And, and here's what I want to say. I want to pause and, and, and reflect for a moment here. Um, that this action is coming after 400 years of slavery, of a system and a group of people who are continually oppressing a, a nation, a minority group of people. And on top of that, there's mass genocide happening. That, that your sin and this sin are not the same. Can we understand that? Can we get that? That, that this is not how God responds when you stub your toe and you say a four-letter word. Can we understand and pull ourselves out from this? That, that God is going after a structure of people who have continually hardened their heart towards God and had no regard for human life for centuries at a time. And this is what, what God is responding to. Can we come into agreement on that? That this is different than regular, everyday kind of sin. Are we good on that? Just give me a thumbs up if you're with me here. Okay, cool. I hope that gives you some encouragement. So now, now God begins to respond even further and he gives very specific instructions. It's fascinating. Very specific instructions as to what's going to happen. Exodus 12 tells us this. Verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male year old, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill the lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. And we're going to skip to verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Both man and beast and all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you or destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. What's happening here? God is now providing a means of escape for both Israel and Egypt. That he's telling them that if you take this lamb and you eat this lamb and have your feast and your meal with it, but then take the blood of that lamb and splatter it over the doorpost of your home, that if you do that, when I enter the land of Egypt to strike and I see that blood, I will pass over that house and your family, your home, everyone in your household will remain safe. He's providing a means of escape, even still, after nine plagues of attempting to convince Pharaoh, even still, he is providing a means of escape, a means of grace. And while Pharaoh, Pharaoh didn't use any discretion about which boy he killed, he just said, all boys, throw them into the Nile. God says, just the firstborn. And as a firstborn son myself... <laughs> I'm a little like, okay, why are you picking on me here, God? Why, why, are you, I don't, why does my brother John not you know, get to get you know, this? Why is he not in danger? You know? uh, but, but I think, and we know this from, from ancient culture, that the firstborn son was the future of the family. That the land, the possession, the wealth, the will, everything went to the firstborn son. Right or wrong, whatever, that's just how it worked. And, and their future was secured in the firstborn son. So get this. When God says that if you put this blood over the doorpost, he is essentially saying that I will save your firstborn son and your future, your future generations will be secured if you listen and trust in the name of the Lord. Grace. However, if you listen to the voice of Pharaoh, I will not, I will not allow your future generations to continue to oppress my people. She says, if you put this blood over the doorpost, you will be safe. Gets weird. You guys ready for some weird stuff? As if it's not weird already, right? So God continues to speak uh, and tell Moses the instructions in, in, verse, uh, in chapter 12. And in verse 12 and 13, it's the first time that God says that he will pass over the house, that he will go over the house that has the blood on it. It's very, very interesting that the first time he says this word Passover, it's a Hebrew word called Passah. And Passah is really interesting because the word literally translated means to limp or to hobble. So it's like, it's like God is saying that I, when, I, when the blood's over the doorpost, that I will limp and hobble through Egypt. 
which doesn't seem to make sense. It seems really out of place. And in fact, we're not the only ones who think so. The ancient Hebrew scholars, when they would translate this word into Greek and Aramaic, they would translate this word to protect or defend. So this verse could quite literally mean that when the blood's over the door, that God will come through the land of Egypt and he will protect and defend the house when he strikes. Which is interesting, because who's he protecting and defending the house from? Himself? What is he doing? Does he have schizophrenia? And he's just like, he he's, has two personalities. He's free. What, what is happening here? And there's a clue later in this story that God tells Moses five different times, five times that he's going to come into the land of Egypt and strike. Once in verse 12, 13, 27, and 29. But the middle verse, you can throw it on the screen. The middle verse in verse 23, he says something different. He tells them that when he comes to uh, strike, that he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. Whoa, who's this destroyer now? So it seems as if God is saying, okay, when I come in to strike, that there's this destroyer that's going to come in and do the striking for me. And if I see the blood over the door, then I'm going to protect and defend the house. Are you confused yet? I'm confused. <laughs> what is happening here? And I think that you and I have a very different view of what the judgment of God looks like in our life. You and I think that if we do something wrong, if we sin, if we make a mistake, that God's just going to come down and he's going to smack us until we learn our lesson. He's going to hit us in the mouth so that we can learn and that we can make the right decision. But I believe that the biblical authors had a very, very different idea of what the judgment of God looked like in their life. And they see and they describe this world in which God is sustaining the world through his mercy and through his grace. And he separates light from darkness. He separates the land from the sea and he's holding the world in order and he's sustaining this, this world. And because of our sin, because of the evil that we have brought into the world, that the forces of darkness are constantly pressing up God's protection and grace, that they are batting against his protection and grace. But God, in his grace and mercy, is holding it at bay. And what happens is, is that there will come a time that when God sees that we are no longer wanting to listen to him, that we don't want anything to do with God, we don't want anything to do with his grace or protection, that he will say, I will give you the desire of your heart and he releases the protection and allows the consequences of our own actions to take a full effect inside of our life. Romans 1 talks about this extensively and in that verse it tells us that, that the wrath of God is being revealed three different times it says this that God will give us over to our sinful desires. It's not what he wants. It's not what he has for us. But he says, but if this is the choice that you want, that you want a life without me, that I will hand you over to the consequences of your own decision. And he's releasing this, uh, this protection. And I think what is happening in this story here, that, that God is giving Pharaoh opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, holding this protection in place. But eventually God releases this protection and allows this destroyer to come in and give full effect to the consequences of Pharaoh's actions. That Pharaoh is now feeling what it feels like of the consequences of what he has done to the people of Israel. And he's having that re-put back onto his head. And we can't get around this either. I'm not trying to, to, to downplay this here. Isn't this still harsh? Is that, well, maybe God's not actively slapping them, but he's allowing it to happen. Is it not still harsh? And I'll say two things. The firstly, I'm not going to sit and pretend that I know all of the answer to this. We have to deal and wrestle with this tension. And I think God invites us to do so. I don't think God's afraid of that. But I also have to say that we have to remember who Pharaoh is. That in ancient culture, Pharaoh believed that he was a god. He believed that he was an incarnate Egyptian god. And what the biblical authors describe is that Pharaoh believes that he is in partnership with the gods of Egypt. He has, he has partnered himself with the forces of evil. He's not just, this is not just an evil action. He's not just making a bad or an immoral decision. He has partnered himself with the very forces of evil. And God is almost saying to Pharaoh here, Pharaoh, you think you are buddy, buddy with these, these forces of evil, with this destroyer. I am going to show you what that actually means to be in league with the forces of darkness. And he allows this destroyer to come and have his way.
The thing that motivates God to action every single time is compassion. That the purpose of this is, again, not to inflict pain, to get Pharaoh to see the error of his ways, to let his people go, and so that Pharaoh would change. He provides this means of grace and says, then I will, I, if you don't want me, I will allow you to have the desires of your heart. I think it also forces us to ask the question, of where have you interpreted God's signs of grace as an act of judgment in your life? Many of us have walked through life and we experience pain, we experience sickness, we experience destruction in our life, and we have this assumption that God is mad at us, that he is punishing us for some reason, whether we know it or not. We believe that God is judging us for something or another. Can I provide for you an alternative viewpoint? Could it be possible that it is not, you're not experiencing this, you're not walking through this because God is mad at you or he's inflicting this upon you? Could it be possible that this just might be the effects and the consequences of living in a broken world? And could it be possible that God could use that pain and suffering that you are experiencing as an act of grace so that he can say to you, come back to me? That it's just like the Israelites, he hears, he sees, and he knows your cries of groaning, and he is responding to you. He says, please, I want nothing more to, but to be in relationship with you. And out of the compassion of his heart, he moves. God is not punishing and judging us. That it could, it just might be the consequences of living in a broken, sinful world. And I think the encouragement of this story is that if we hear that, if we see this, that we would not turn our hearts, our eyes, our ears away. That we would, become, we would come running back to the protection and the grace of God. I think that this is the message of this story with Pharaoh. The interesting thing about Pharaoh is that this wasn't even severe enough. After he let the people go, he changed his mind about five minutes later. Even this was not enough for Pharaoh to change his mind. God is calling to you. And he desperately wants to bring you into his protection, into his grace. Will you respond to that call? I'm going to invite the worship team up. And if you're not confused already... I got one more thing to throw at you, which I find is really intriguing, is that Israel was not exempt from this plague, that their firstborn son was also in danger from being struck down. And I have to wonder why, what did they do to deserve this? Like they, they didn't do anything wrong in this scenario. Why were they in danger of the firstborn plague? And I think as God often does, that God is working in the confines of the story, but as he often, often does, he is doing and he is showing Israel and us something so much greater. In chapter 12 of Exodus, that God kind of stops the narrative. It's a story and you follow along with these characters, but he stops the narrative and gives instructions about this event to Moses. And he tells Israel and Moses that today, this day, every year from now, you are to celebrate this day as the day that I saved you from Egypt, that I brought salvation to your people. You are to celebrate this as the day that I saved you from the plague of the firstborn son, and I want you to remember and celebrate it. And it's this huge celebration. It's like the Jewish Christmas that they call Passover. And they celebrate this, a week-long celebration. And would you believe me if I told you that Jesus timed his death 1,000 years on Passover? That his death, the death that would take away the sins of the world, where his blood would wash our sins away so that we can be in the protection and the grace of God, that he timed his death at 
Passover. And during this event, he has his final last supper with his disciples. And as everyone is celebrating Passover, he says, when you eat this bread and when you drink this wine, remember this whole Passover thing that you're celebrating? Now I actually want you to remember me. And Jesus is making the audacious claim that he is the Passover lamb, the lamb that they sacrificed to cleanse their sins and to protect them, that Jesus is that Passover lamb. And he goes to this cross so that you and I, you and I can be in the grace and in the love of the Father. And God is screaming, calling, begging to you, saying, return to me. Trust in the name of Jesus and you too can be saved. That he is this Passover lamb. And get this. He holds the authority and the position of the firstborn son. That what was meant for us, he took upon himself and says, if you trust in me, if you follow me, that you too can be saved. And my hope for you is if you hear his voice, do not run. He's calling out to you. You think he is a God of anger and judgment. You think he is mad at you, but he wants nothing more than relationship with you. And he will move kingdoms and mountains and earth to be with you. Will you respond to the grace of Jesus, to the compassion of the father? Let's pray. Father, we come before you. And we thank you for your grace. And Lord, we admit we don't understand the severity of the story and it makes us uncomfortable. But Lord, I pray that we don't run from that, that we wrestle that with you in prayer, that we bring it before you and we, we go back and forth and allow this story to mold us so that we can see you in a way of grace and compassion and love for your people. We're so grateful that you hear us, that you see us and you know us. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and respond to God in worship.